Evening. I spent nearly 30 years working in conservation, hands-on and teaching and training people. Most of that time I was dealing with trees and woodland and every day I learned something new. Uh, TED is about ideas worth spreading and I think this is one. The UK government has set targets for planting millions of trees over the next few years as a way to counteract the climate crisis. Is this the right thing to do? Can planting masses of trees solve the climate crisis? Well, in short, no. Not on its own. But increasing the number of trees has to be part of the solution if we do it right. The basic issue is that you can't deal with a complex problem with a simple solution. Everything in our society is presented to us as binary. This is right, this is wrong. But very few things are like that. Very few things are that simple. And anything to do with the environment or climate is anything but binary. This is incredibly complex and everything is interlinked and interdependent. So someone says, we'll plant 30 million trees over a few years and that'll sort it. Well, no, it won't. Just as fitting catalytic converters to every vehicle didn't solve the problem of vehicle exhaust pollution, it'll fail because concentrating on one aspect makes us take our eye off the ball. It allows us to feel good and we walk away congratulating ourselves on having cracked it, but we haven't. And we won't unless we face it and deal with it properly. Ecology isn't rocket science. It's a lot more complex than rocket science. Because <laughs> with a working knowledge of Newtonian physics and a slide rule, you can predict exactly where your satellite will be in orbit. But how much do we really know about how an ecosystem really works? particularly the stuff that we can't see. We write the books and we push nature into boxes, but nature doesn't read the books and it won't fit in the boxes. The more we find out about biodiversity, the more we realise we don't yet know. Here's a phrase I guarantee nobody expected to hear tonight. Donald Rumsfeld had a point. There are unknown unknowns. We just don't know what we don't know. This ancient oak, seven, eight hundred year old maybe. So that could have been there when the Magna Carta was signed. You know, that's a big, big thought, isn't it? Now, that tree on its own is an incredibly value, valuable ecosystem, but we're finding more all the time out about how it works, but we're just scratching the surface of that. And as I say, what about the stuff we can't see? What's going on underground? We're coming to realise that the soil is the key. There's far more biodiversity underground than above ground. Each shovel of an ancient woodland soil holds more living things than all the human beings ever born. And the tree is interacting with all those organisms. The roots and the things that the roots interact with extend much further than we used to think. So you're not just looking at that tree, you're actually standing on that tree. Many fungi have symbiotic relationships with trees. This combination of tree and fungi is known as mycorrhiza. This is fly agaric, many people recognise it. It's associated specifically with birch trees. And what you see is the tip of the iceberg. It, it, most of that fungus is underground, the mycelium. It's a, a network of tendrils, often microscopic, in and around the roots. The tree is absolutely dependent on this mycorrhiza relationship. There are loads of these amazing facts about soil. A teaspoon of forest soil may hold more than 10 miles of this mycelium, and the mycorrhiza network attached to a tree like that one, well, it could reach to the moon and back. The Ancient Tree Forum recently shared some research data. There are fungi in tree seeds and lots of different species in there. And we don't know what they all do yet. Some of them might be beneficial, some of them won't be. They also found fungi in tree DNA and only 10% of those were recognisable. And there's more. Every site is unique. This place with its habitats and its species, its pressures, its constraints, its weather is unique. And it's in a constant state of change. And page four has gone somewhere. There it is. <laughs> it was different yesterday. It will be different tomorrow, next season and next year. The green stuff keeps growing. Weather happens and people do things. And then there's the time scales. Look at the time it takes for a tree to reach anything like maturity and the much longer time needed for that woodland habitat to develop fully. Nature works on a much longer time scale than we do and this is being known as tree time. So if we're dealing with trees, we have to think in tree time, not 
a one-year budget cycle. Yet we're conditioned to expect green stuff to happen quickly. In, in say, the 30 minutes filled by a garden makeover programme, this is known as the Titchmarsh paradox. <laughs> but we have to deal with reality. And from this to this took 30 years and a hell of a lot of work. So what do we take from this, this tree-time concept? Well, what we take, first of all, is we don't have enough time to wait for our new trees to grow and do their stuff. Earlier this year, an ex-colleague of mine was looking at an application to, to fell a big sycamore, about 120 years old, really major piece of timber. Don't worry, they said, we'll plant some trees to replace it. She calculated that to replace the carbon held in that tree would need 37,000 whips, that's saplings, planted. 37,000. Over many years, a lot of those that survived would grow to exceed that sycamore, but we don't have time to wait for that. We've got to act now. And it wouldn't replace that habitat around the, the sycamore. So if it takes generations before that tree is producing the benefits, carbon sequestration, for instance, then we need to manage better what we've got now and build on it. The UK has a very low level of woodland cover, but far more important is the poor management of much of those existing trees and woodland. Isaac Newton said, if I've achieved anything, it was by standing on the shoulders of giants. So we need to look at what's there already and look after it and build on it. We don't just ignore it and start afresh. This means it's more a question of quality rather than just quantity. We don't just need tree planters, we need tree carers. Like other natural things, trees, whether it's city trees, urban park, woodland nature reserve, hedgerow, field boundary, your garden, they bring lots of benefits to us and the planet. So benefits like biodiversity, shade, shelter from the wind, they provide oxygen, carbon sequestration, they clean pollution out of the atmosphere, they help in flood management, they provide economic benefits through timber and food production and tourism and beauty. These are known as ecosystem services or public goods. It's the benefits that natural things provide. But there's another one, a really big one, that more of us have discovered in the last 18 months. That's the benefits that nature brings to our physical and mental health. This isn't pseudoscience. It's quantifiable and peer-reviewed. And it's been around for decades. In the new MRI scanning suite at, at Stepping Hill, you look up at what looks like a roof light with a permanent view of blue sky through the leaves of a woodland canopy. And so this green stuff makes us feel better, it reduces stress and it promotes recovery. Even looking at it, even looking at a picture of it has an impact. And it's called biophilia and it's really not a new idea. So how do we make planting trees bring us these positive effects? How to make sure it does that and that our efforts aren't wasted? Because we need to maximise the impact from anything we do. Because time's running out. Well, before you get the old spade out of the shed, ask yourself five questions. What's my aim? What do I want to achieve by doing this? What trees am I going to plant? Where, I w where will I plant them? Where will I get those trees from? And can I look after them? We just work our way through that. Uh, yeah, it makes sense to have a plan, have an idea of what you want to do, why you're doing it, and keep working towards that. Think what it'll look like. Do you really want to be looking at straight lines of trees in 20 years' time? Will that achieve what you want to do? And the real benefits come from the habitat in and around that tree. So you aim at the habitat, not the tree. So when you're planting your trees, have a mind to what you want to achieve. And this isn't just sticking trees in the ground, it's planting with a purpose. So do you want this? Now that's 20 odd year old plantation with no management done to it whatsoever. Really poor, in fact, there's no real woodland structure to it. Uh, very poor habitat, really poor trees because they're all far too close together, and really poor carbon sequestration as a, as a result. Or do you want this? Now that's taken from exactly the same spot, two and a half growing seasons after some thinning work was done. So all of those ecosystem services have vastly improved. Woodland structure is fantastic, it's brilliant for wildlife, and it looks good. It's nice to be in. We'll take question two and three together because the question of what tree and where is, is controlled by the same rule. It's right tree, right place. So you, you want to match your tree to the location. 
It needs to be native trees, ideally grown as close as possible to the site, because they co-evolved with the rest of the local ecosystem. I'll give you a couple of examples of why. Um, maybe 15, 20 years ago, in, in the southwest coastal region of France, they planted thousands of maritime pines to re-establish the lost habitat that would have been there. They were the right species, but they were imported from further south in Europe, so they'd grown up with different conditions. And they couldn't cope with the cold winter weather coming in from the Atlantic, and many died in the first couple of years. So that was a bit of a waste. And then, second example, lots, thousands of hawthorns were planted on UK motorway verges. Again, 20-odd years ago. But they were imported from southern Europe, from Greece, I think it was. And they flowered early. And the problem with that was that lots of other species have evolved to coincide with the arrival of hawthorn blossom. So the insects would arrive to eat the blossom and the birds would arrive to eat the insects, but they were all too late. So they were just, it co-evolved with different conditions. Also, unfortunately, we now have to consider how the trees we plant will cope with the changed climate in the future. Is this the right place to plant trees at all? Will planting trees make things better? What's there already might be an important habitat. For instance, it could be peat, which holds far more carbon than even a dense woodland and supports really special biodiversity, or species-rich grassland that is excellent for carbon and for biodiversity. The conditions might well not be right for trees at all. If you can make this out, this is at Green Low. It's a, a failed plantation on lime waste. So these trees, thousands of them, were planted to cover up this old grey massive mountain of lime waste. But conditions weren't right for trees and many of them failed, as you can see there. And the ones that didn't fail are still stunted, they're really tiny. Conditions weren't right for the trees, but conditions were right for a, a really special and rare limestone grassland that developed instead. That's triple SI standard, it's a fabulous area. Nobody expected that to happen. To get maximum benefits, we should be aiming to be as natural as possible. So if that had been thought through, you could have actually gone for that habitat and put some trees in it as well and mixed it all up. It certainly, if we were going for something natural, wouldn't be the standard planting regime of 4,000 trees per hectare, all planted in straight lines at 1.5 metre centres. It'd be a mix of habitats. That's what was there before humans started knocking it about. The maximum biodiversity value is found at the interfaces, the edges between these habitats. This, for instance, is this would have been a far more common site than wall-to-wall -wall trees. This is an ancient wood pasture at uh, Longshore Estate. Really ancient landscape, this. It would have been possibly more likely grazed than this, um, but the trees are spread through grassland, heathland, scrub. It's in a, a fantastically biodiversity-rich mosaic. Uh, I'm working with a group of people at the moment who, who've bought grounds specifically to plant trees and I'm hoping that now they understand more about it they're going to be aiming at a mix of habitats even possibly something like that they know now that it will produce a better spread of benefits across the board than just wall-to-wall -wall trees and it will produce those benefits quicker and it will be nicer for them to be in question four is a big one where am I going to get the trees from Native grown trees are already in short supply. Demand has outstripped supply. So you'd be lucky to find an oak if you went to get one tomorrow. The UK nursery industry doesn't have the capacity to supply the millions of three-year-old trees and whips the cold to plant. It can't instantly increase this production. It needs planning, confidence, investment and time to produce them. And we're not seeing that on the necessary scale. And this is where we're going to really shoot ourselves in the foot. Most people won't even know to ask where the trees come from. I mean, an oak tree is an oak tree, right? No. Um, and they'll be imported. And that's how we got ash dieback, phytophthora, acute oak decline, oak processionary moth. And that's how we'll get the next tree pathogen that's coming off the rank to come over. Many ash trees planted in the UK in the last few years were technically native provenance. Native, they were British trees, but... They were, in fact, started in the UK, then they were shipped to the Netherlands, where they were grown on for a couple of years in the huge industry they got there, and then brought back, ready infected with ash dieback. So it's going to happen unless we're very careful about it. The last question is, how am I going to look after them? And the best way I can explain this is by those two photographs I showed you earlier on. 
This one is without any looking after. Stick it in the ground, walk away from it. And this one is after some looking after. It's not just a one-off hit. You've got to keep doing that over, over the life of that tree. So you've got to protect it from rabbits, sheep, deer, thin it out periodically, add new trees in, extend it. And crucially, you've got to enjoy it. So what conclusions do we get? David Attenborough said this, no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they've never experienced. So if we want a viable, sustainable environment, we have to have more of society aware of their environment and what it has for them so that they care about it enough to want to protect it. And if it's sufficiently important to enough people that have got voting and buying power, then that will put pressure on those running things and making things and selling us things to do something other than window dressing or greenwash. But how do we get this greater buy-in from society? You can't sell a vision of environmental disaster. It's too big and it's too frightening. What can I do about it? But what you can sell is a vision of hope, of a way to achieve something good, to empower people, to show them how they can make a difference. There's the best part of 70 million of us in this country, and if only 10% of us did a bit, that's 7 million bits, and that adds up to our, an awful lot. So that's been the most important part of my work for nearly 30 years, to change perceptions and show people that they can do something about it, they can make a difference. And the best way I ever found to do this, to get people wound up about it, if you like, is getting people out into the green stuff and get their hands dirty if, if possible, and particularly if they're going to do something to make that green stuff better and to enjoy it while they're doing it. I've seen the effect of tree planting on people. It's magical. I've seen people with no experience of this stuff light up. It's a commitment to the future, and it does make a difference if done right. And we'll get even further, as I said, if we care for the trees rather than just simply plant them. So it can be part of the solution to the climate emergency. To put it another way, we need to get more people hooked on the environment and planting and caring for trees might just be the gateway drug. <laughs>